This annual lecture celebrates the Norman E. Alexander Foundation's generous endowments to establish the Norman E. Alexander Library of Jewish Studies and also to establish a position for the first Librarian for Jewish Studies at Columbia. It's a post capably and expertly held by Michelle Chesner. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> A third Alexander Endowment supports the library's rare book and manuscript holdings, including important Judaica resources and Hebrew manuscripts. And it's one of the largest collections in the country. We have digitized and made available online more than 200 of these manuscripts in their entirety. In addition to celebrating, celebrating the Norman E. Alexander Foundation's great gift to Columbia's libraries on this the 10th anniversary of that gift. This annual lecture also signifies the library's enduring commitment to supporting the field of Jewish studies at Columbia. I want to thank especially Norman Alexander's daughter, Gail Benderman, who is with us tonight, for her enthusiasm and support of the collections and all of its related programs. Thank you so much, Gail. And now I present the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies, Michelle Chesner, who will introduce tonight's speaker. This lecture is sponsored annually by the libraries in gratitude to the generous gift of the Alexander Foundation in sponsoring the Norman E. Alexander Library for Jewish Studies. This year, as Anne said, is the 10th anniversary of the Foundation's gift, which was awarded to Columbia University Libraries in 2008. The Alexander Foundation provided funding for the first librarian of Jewish studies at Columbia, as well as special funds for both general and special collections. It is a direct result of this gift that Columbia's Judaica collection has achieved worldwide prominence and has been able to continue to grow and contribute significantly within the world of Jewish studies. I remember when I, first mounted, when I mounted my first exhibition in 2012, I was questioned as to why, I quote, JTS's manuscripts were on exhibit at Columbia. I explained to the dumbfounded visitor that, in fact, these wonderful collections actually did belong to these, this institution and, in many cases, had been there even before the Jewish Theological Seminary was established. I don't get those kinds of questions so much anymore. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I must acknowledge the tragic timeliness in the title of tonight's lecture, so soon after a particularly horrific shooting so close to home where the shooter specifically targeted Jews for being Jews. I'd like to take this moment to wish a speedy recovery to those injured in Saturday's terrible events, and to remember Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Mallinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, Irving Younger, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, and Sylvan Simon. Thank you. And now, I'd like to introduce Professor Benjamin R. Gempel. Professor Gempel is the Dina and Ellie Field Family Chair in Jewish History at the Jewish Theological Seminary. A scholar of medieval Sephardic Jewry, Professor Gempel's most recent book is, is Anti-Jewish Riots in the Crown of Aragon and the Royal Response, 1391 to 1392, which won the 2016 National Jewish Book Award for Scholarship. Professor Gampel is proud to be amongst Salo Baron's academic grandchildren, having studied with Baron's students Svi and Cori, Ismar Shorsh, Arthur Hertzberg, and Yosef Yerushalmi. We look forward to hearing Professor Gampel discuss Baron's legacy in Re-Embracing the Lacrimose Hist the Theory of Jewish History, Dialogue with a Columbia Tradition. Hi, everyone. It's absolutely wonderful to be here to be able to return to Columbia and to speak about Professor Barone. That's an extraordinary opportunity and an honor. I'm particularly heartened that my colleagues are in this room, my teachers, my family, my friends, and heartened by the fact that Sailor Barone's legacy is of interest to so many of us. Columbia was formative in my academic training. Some of what I teach, what I continue to teach, and how I think was formed on this campus. 
So thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Salo Barone. Ah, the first occupant of the Miller Chair of Jewish History, Literature, and Institutions at Columbia was arguably the founder of Jewish historical studies in the United States. And I imagine that no one will give me an argument, especially here this evening, that Salo Barone additionally was one of the most influential Jewish historians of the 20th century. He was born in 1895 to a wealthy family in Galicia, in southeastern Poland, in Turna and Tarnow. And as many Galician Jews, prior to World War I, he moved to Vienna. And at the University of Vienna, he earned three doctorates in history, political science, and law. And he received an advanced Jewish education in that city as well. The Jewish Institute of Religion, under the leadership of Rabbi Stephen Wise, invited him to come to the United States in 1926. He was lured away from the Jewish Institute of Religion in 1929 to occupy the Miller Chair. Salo Baron was not American, was not born here, but he made America his home. And he taught here until his retirement in 1963. In 1928, Almost 90 years ago, Barone wrote an essay for a leading Jewish periodical, the Menorah Journal, which he entitled Ghetto and Emancipation. 90 years ago, and its ideas still resonate today. It was a revolutionary article. And in the space of 90 years, people have quibbled with so many aspects of it. But it was breathtaking. Barone decided and announced to American Jews he was writing for the Menorah Journal. He was not writing in an academic forum. And he announced to American Jews that they misunderstood the meaning of ghetto and emancipation. Ghetto was, had a negative valence. Jews being locked in at night, lack of freedom, lack of movement, lack of an inability to intellectually explore, and emancipation, civil rights, ah, our dream, our dream to join the external society, to gain the benefits from the culture around us, to succeed, every minority's fantasy that will be like them, will learn from them, will grow. Barone flips our understanding of ghetto and emancipation. The ghetto was not that bad. The ghetto allowed the Jews to thrive. The ghetto allowed the Jews to create an extraordinary social fabric. Yes, there were disabilities, but he argued that this, these disabilities paled to the disabilities that other individuals experienced in pre-traditional society. Barone argued that the Jews were far more economically successful than others, Sure, they suffered from restrictions, but less than most. Even their uh, social lives were richer. Barone also spoke about the emancipation. The emancipation, he said, was not a golden age. Barone was crucially aware already in 1928 that the destruction of the ghetto walls, the citizenship granted to the Jews, much was lost. Especially the institutional corporate embodiment of Jewish autonomy, the Jewish community. And Barone said, and at that point in 1928, presciently, that he sees no reason to imagine that modernity would be safer for the Jews. 
than the medieval world. So disposed, Salo Baron opined about the Middle Ages, surely it is time to break with the lachrymose theory of pre-revolutionary woe and to adopt a view more in accord with historic truth. Baron would make his name on this anti lachrymose theory. That was his propelling idea. Jewish history is not a veil of suffering. It is not endless sadness. And frankly, also, it is not simply a period of suffering and rabbinic literature. There is more to Jewish life than that. Baron was dedicated already from 1928 to attempt to prove to Jews, to America, if you will, to the world, to the West, that Jewish history followed the same rules as all other people's history. And that Jewish life can be seen in many respects as a success. So motivated, Baron investigates the social and religious history of the Jews. And in 1937, many of you know, he publishes his social and religious history in three volumes. On medieval Jewish history, which is my focus this evening, Baron gives us three chapters on the medieval Jewish experience. How does he take his anti lacrimose conception and how does he work it out in terms of the actual Middle Ages? Well, in his first chapter on the medieval period, the last chapter in volume one, he entitles Infidel. Seems like a startling title for somebody who is looking on and looking for the successes of the Jews. In it, he describes Islam as a dynamic force, the caliphate culturally and economically superior to the Byzantine Empire, and mentions that the Jewish people quickened and entered another period of great achievement. Baron was not blind to anti-Jewish animus. Baron says openly, Islam was by no means friendly to Judaism. But Barone had a sweeping panoramic view. Although the Jews had the status of infidels, he still felt that their status was enviable compared to the Christians, compared to others. When we as historians today look back at Barone's chapter on Islam, we know far much more, of course, than Barone did, thanks to the researchers in the Geniza. But this vision of Jews under Islam, especially during its first few centuries, as being a time of economic and religious vitality has remained with us. In volume two, Barone has a chapter called The Wanderer, Jews in Christian Europe. Oh, Barone does not turn a blind eye. Oh, not to... Um, the economic decline of Jewish traders. He doesn't turn a blind eye to their elimination from agriculture, to the difficulties Jews had with guilds, to the relatively few periods of affluence. But Barone continues to argue that there are positive moments. Jewish serfdom, which was seen prior to Barone as being the absolute nadir of Jewish life, Barone argues that Jewish serfdom is an aspect of protection and that the Jews thrived in Christian Europe. And he continues on. Barone argues that it's not the church that is the enemy of the Jews, but rather it was the latent nationalism. I must say, reading this chapter again, 
we do see Sailor Barone having greater challenges trying to make sense out of this period than he did under Islam. It's a very, very difficult period for him to put a rosy face on. Barone almost, when you read him, you get a sense of what his later writings were to be. He just simply is speaking and writing on and on without a clear thesis but desperate to prove that Christians and Jews, and especially the Jewish life, um, was positive. Barone really saved his greatest contribution, I think, in the first volume, in his chapter entitled Within the Ghetto Walls. There Barone comes to life, continuing his assault on the lacrimose theory by focusing on the Jewish corporate status, the technical ghetto, proud of the great success of Jewish law. As he says, rabbinic social philosophy strengthens solidarity so necessary to the people's struggle for survival. He praises scholasticism, and surprisingly reading it again, he is enamored with Kabbalah, and he sees Jewish mysticism as a sign that Jewish life and Jewish intellectual life is thriving. Just from reading 1937, the social and religious history, we begin to get a sense of what Barone is after. Yes, Barone is dedicated to an anti-lacrimose conception of Jewish history, but at the same time, Barone is aware of the evidence and he's attempting to incorporate evidence of attacks on Jews, of difficulties that the Jews had within and still remaining with this anti-lacrimose conception. The second edition of Barone's work, he started in 1951, started publishing it in 1952. It extended to 18 volumes. Barone and others have said it before me, simply did not know how to stop. <laughs> he was so dedicated, so propelled by this anti-lacrimose theory that he spends volume after volume charting Jewish life in a sweeping geographical panorama. Barone concludes, and really he doesn't, he leaves it for us to conclude, <coughs> that Jewish life in the Middle Ages was something to be envied. In the second edition, I would argue, it becomes clear what was at stake for Barone in his argument for the anti-lacrimose conception of Jewish history. For Sailor Barone, although trained as a modernist, medieval Jewish history was his model. Barone started to write in the shadow of the period after World War I. The idea of Jews and others having minority rights in this new post-World War I period, that Jews would have the benefits of citizenship, but yet at the same time enjoy a kind of communal life, if you will, a modified medievalism, is what stimulated him. But Rome was dedicated to prove that medieval Jewish life was a life that people could imagine was something that Jews could be well be proud of. What I'd like to continue to do this evening is, thank you, is to focus on the medieval period. Hmm. And test out whether Barone's comments were correct. Is an anti-lacrimose perception of medieval Jewish history appropriate? Does it stand up over time? 
Is Barone's particular attitude off base? Jews in the medieval period lived under Christianity and lived under Islam. Under Christianity and Islam, Jews played a role within these dominant religions' theology. The role they played within these other religions' theology often led to negative perceptions of the Jews, indeed, as we know, attacks on Jews. But Barone was also mindful of and correct in understanding that it's precisely because the Jews mattered to Christianity and mattered to Islam that the Jews were also protected and that the Jews were also able to create an extraordinary communal life. Let's turn our attention now to one geographical area, an area I know a bit about. Turn our attention to the Iberian Peninsula in the Middle Ages and see specifically if Barone's arguments seem to be justified. The Iberian Peninsula is an interesting place to test out Barone's hypothesis. After all, this is an area, this is an arena, this is a time period where Jews have imagined that life was exceptional. Starting already in the 19th century, Jews perceived about their life within the Iberian Peninsula that it was a golden age, that it was extraordinary, that it was a time of great Jewish religious vitality, that it was a time of great Jewish success politically, it was a time of cultural creativity. And in fact, that fantasy is not simply only the fantasy of Jews. It's the fantasy of all those who study the Iberian Peninsula. Spanish, Portuguese historians, even today, imagine a convivencia. Starting from the early 20th century in Americo Castro, imagine a convivencia with Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together and effuse each other with their ideas. It's almost like a playground for an imagination that life could be good even in times where there are dominant monotheisms. But a closer look at the Jews of Iberia closer look at what was later called Sephardic Jewry already begins to suggest to us that this image of a golden age cannot be sustained. Even during the Muslim period when the Jews were welcome at court and the Jews uh, created an exceptionally original Jewish culture, even during those times a careful study of the literature indicates to us that the Jews were less than sanguine about their future, that anxiety propelled them, that they were aware that their status and their fate sometimes hung by a thread. The great Shmuel Hanagid, vizier perhaps to the king of Granada, if Moshe Ibn Ezra is correct, also commander-in-chief of the armies of Granada, Shmuel Hanagid is successful, and yet when his son takes over his position from him after Shmuel dies, Yehosef, perhaps in a wrong political choice, is murdered, and Jews are killed in the streets of Granada. At the central point of the Golden Age, it's quite clear that Jewish status is not something that can be relied upon. Jews become aware during the Islamic period that the reasons for success are contingent upon their service to the king. 
and with a misstep, all of the accomplishments of the Jewish courtier could simply dissolve. The Muslims who had provided a home for the Jews, a cultural, intellectual home, also began to turn on the Jews in the late 11th and 12th centuries. The coming of the Almoravids, the Almohades, and Jewish life became more and more marginal under Islam. If we move to the Christian period, Jews at first are successful. The Jews are mediators between Christianity and Islam. They are managers, financial managers for the kings and queens. The Jews are diplomats. The Jews are successful traders. The Jews achieve great prominence in the 13th century as the Jews are seen by the Christians as allies against the hated Muslims. But the success is fleeting as well. Even in the midst of this success, Jewish status is under attack. If we follow, for example, the history of Alfonso X, Alfonso El Sabio, Alfonso who had Jews within his court, Jews who were crucial in his cultural attempts to transfer the knowledge of the Greco-Roman world from Islam to Christendom. This same Alfonso X turns on the Jews towards the end of his life, and Jews are held for ransom, and the Jewish community is seriously harmed. The great James I, James the Conqueror, who has Jews controlling the royal treasury. The great James I, who includes the Jews in the highest realms of his kingdom, is the same James who already in 1240 forces Jews to listen to sermons and, as well, stages a public disputation in Chris with Christians in Barcelona. Studying the history of the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula, studying the history of the Sfaradim, we can revel in the Jews' successes. We can be mindful of their accomplishments. But we're also aware at the same time, at the same moment, of the fragility of their lives. We wonder whether the anti lacrimos conception is convincing. Can we really think that the Jews, even in a country and over a time period, which is considered to be a hallmark of Jewish accomplishment, whether indeed Jews can be seen as living a full and rich life? I've spent the last number of years focusing on a decidedly sad event in Jewish history. At the end of the 14th century, the Jews of Spain, in Castile and Aragon, were subject to attacks. Jews are massacred in Castile. Jews are killed in the crown of Aragon. The links that the Jews had made with governmental authorities have not served to protect them. But I don't want to use moments of attacks specifically to debunk, if you will, Barone's thesis. Barone was aware of violence to the Jewish communities. There had always been violence. But what I do want to focus on is that the Jews during the attacks appealed to the royal authorities time and again. And what the Jews realized as a minority people were that they simply weren't high on the governmental agenda. <coughs> 
1391 and the events of 1391 proved to the Jews if they needed any clarity at all is that their life, that their lives as a minority group were dependent and dependent upon others and dependent upon other people who do not see them necessarily as the most valuable asset in the royal domain. And as far as Jews and successful Jews at the court, we find that the great Chastai Kreskes, wonderful Jewish philosopher, leader of the Jewish community, who fought valiantly on behalf of the Jews at the court, pleading with the monarchs to intervene, that he ultimately was not effective. Not only wasn't he effective, but even his attempts to save his own son were unsuccessful. This doesn't seem to be a time period where we could speak about comfortably focus on Jewish uh, power. Rather, what we're aware of is not only Jews being harmed, but also Jewish political impotence. In many respects, I'm the student of Salo Barone. I root the history of the Jews, as he did as well, within the governments and societies in which the Jews lived. I'm led to pursue the social history of which Barone preached for. And yet, what we're left with, we're left with a sense of emptiness. All of you sitting here, I imagine, know that in the end of the 15th century, the Jews were expelled from the kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula. First in 1492 from Castile and Aragon, in 1496, seven from Portugal, in 1498 from Navarre. And there, in my first book, Barone's influence is present. My goal was in the first book to show that even on the eve of this last expulsion, the Jews had a successful economic life. The Jews continued to live as if they had as they had lived in decades prior, that even on the eve of catastrophe or possible looming catastrophe, the Jews always trusted in the ongoing nature of their community. So, if the medieval period, and even the medieval period in Spain, is a period where, yes, there were Jewish successes, yes, there were extraordinary cultural achievements, but yes, at the same time, there was a vulnerability that was experienced by the Jews on a daily basis. How can we begin to appreciate what Barone was trying to do? Barone, in 1928, was determined, was determined to prove that a Jewish community, a Jewish community even just granted minority rights under other governments, that that kind of a Jewish community could be a model for the contemporary period. He kept to those ideas. He strikingly kept to those ideas. 
even after the destruction of European Jewry in the 20th century, and even after the rise of the State of Israel. In 1963, in his essay, Newer Emphases in Jewish History, he wrote, all my life I have been struggling against the hitherto dominant lachrymose conception of Jewish history, a term which I have been using for more than 40 years because I have felt that an overemphasis on Jewish sufferings distorted the total picture of the Jewish historical evolution and at the same time badly served a generation which had become impatient with the nightmare of endless persecutions and massacres. Indeed, the entire project of his second edition, started in 1951, was probably motivated by the notion that despite what had just happened, despite the Holocaust, despite the rise of the State of Israel, Baron was still committed to the idea that a modified medievalism was still a possible, possible way for the recreation of Jewish communities. As Baron said in writing, after the war, the Jews have learned through their history that they could live without a state, without a territory, and without a language. Salem Baron, when you read his volumes, in some respects, was correct. We should not overemphasize Jewish suffering. We should pay attention to Jewish successes. He was correct. We need to go country by country and notice where the Jews lived and lived for periods at a time with fruitful relationships with their neighbors. But while Baron is correct, what we seem to miss is, we seem to miss the con continuous feeling of Jewish vulnerability. My argument here tonight is not that Baron was wrong in the sense of his desire to look upon the positive moments in Jewish history, but rather that his categories and ways of research, thinking about Jewish history in terms of the anti lachrymose conception, is simply not useful, either for a way of understanding Jewish history or even for Jewish life today. In our time period, now, to argue for an anti lachrymose conception of Jewish history, to try to imagine a past not only through the veil of tears, is not necessarily a useful message for the Jewish community. For most American Jews, they're already convinced that Jewish life is not lachrymose. And they're not inclined to imagine that a modified medievalism is an answer to their challenges. After the destruction of European Jewry and the rise of the State of Israel, when West, the West and Israel realities of Jewish life there are new governing ideas and paradigms that we need to welcome, and not ones that were forged in the wake of World War I. A Jewish history which focuses on the fact that the Jews are continually reliant on others, that that is the fate of a minority group, that they're reliant on others whether they live within a democratic society or within a sovereign state, 
those probably are points of view that need to be stressed. I want to re-embrace a lachrymosity of Jewish history, not one of pogroms or an emphasis on suffering in rabbinic literature. We today can recognize Jewish history as lachrymose and at the same time acknowledge the Jews' social and religious creativity over time. We no longer need to worry, as Jews did maybe a decade or two ago, that lachrymosity could threaten to overwhelm the Jewish community. The Holocaust, as we well know, has already lost traction amongst the Jews. Its meaning does not necessarily galvanize the Jewish community. While Barone was right about medieval Jewish life and the pitfalls of modernity, the Jewish, and the Jewish experience was not one of unrelieved suffering, still the nature of Jewish life and its particular fears must be newly appreciated. A lachrymose understanding of Jewish history is helpful. We can't afford to be naive either socially or religiously. What my research on 1391 taught me, and I think teaches all of us, that it's not just the violence that the Jews need to be concerned about, but it's the impotence and our lack of importance and those of our intercessors. It's interesting, Barone, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, wrote the anti lacrimose theory for a popular Jewish audience, not an academic one. And here, strangely, I am at Columbia, where I'm speaking to an academic audience about what might be best for the Jews, what the Jewish historical agenda might or should be. I think this gives me a time as well to reflect on the last number of years since I was a student here. When I was a student here, special pleading on behalf of minorities to sit in a class and to say openly that you cared about a particular religious or ethnic group was looked upon askance, was a sign that you weren't dispassionate, that objective history was not your calling card. But in the last number of years, university life has changed. Special pleading is no longer seen that way. Articulation on behalf of particular groups is seen positively. You're seen now as an engaged historian, as a historian who cares about the subjects which he or she addresses. Life has changed. Columbia University has changed. The existence of a Jewish librarian is a reflection of that change. So there Salo Baron is in 1928. He's arguing to the Jews, yes, look back upon your history. It's not a veil of suffering. Acculturation is positive. You can create a modified form of a Jewish community. That is your future. But here we are. You don't need to prove to American Jews that acculturation is positive. It is not a message that needs to be heard. Jews are comfortable in America. They've succeeded. Perhaps, oh, not an emphasis on lachrymosity, but an awareness of it, a willingness to stress it, a willingness to say that Jewish life was vulnerable even at times of the greatest success, that even as I tout the glories of Sephardic Jewry, which I skimmed over, it's necessary to remember that Jewish life, even in the Iberian Peninsula, was fraught. <laughs>
Nachmanides, the great Nachmanides who participated in the debate in Barcelona against Pablo Cristiani, can say in his commentary on the Torah that he's writing for the Efe Galut, to those who are tired of exile. To people who are tired, who are tired of the tension. I come here to praise Salo Baron. He taught my teachers. My teacher, Professor Shorsh, is in the audience. He taught my teacher, Tzvi Ankori, my first professor of medieval Jewish history. He taught my teacher, Arthur Hertzberg, the maverick historian of the modern Jewish experience and of Zionism. And he taught my doctor father, Yosef Yerushalmi, who was so proud to have been the student of Barone. Yet Barone allowed us precisely to critique him. Barone writes in his third volume, read the last chapter, it's still stirring talking about historic midrash, that Jewish history is a text that we constantly interpret and reinterpret. As he writes in volume two, the interpretation and reinterpretation of the history of the people, a kind of historic midrash, is now to serve as the guidance for the future. Barone was right. Jewish history follows the same rules as the history of other peoples, but we do have our own variations. Not that our history is worse than others, not that it's always bad, but let's stop striving to prove the good. Try to keep both visions in your mind at the same time and not just those binary opposites. Imagine that you are in the 10th century in Sepharad and you're enjoying the wine and the song and the garden parties and you're exulting in the creation of literature and reading Muslim tomes which give you a sense of what the Jewish curriculum should look like and know that the Jews at the exact same time are feeling extraordinarily vulnerable that a poet like Dunashim Labrat can use the term, we're still mi'usim u'gu'ulim, we are despised. It may mean in the final analysis, when I think about Jewish history, and I think about the success of minority groups, that frankly, I don't accept the simple notion of progress embraced by the West. I'm not eternally sanguine about the fortunes of the Jews, nor of the world in which we live. And frankly, neither was Barone, as he demonstrated in his Ghetto and Emancipation essay. Even in an interview in 1985, with the New York Times as he approached his 90th birthday. In the words of Joseph Berger, who was the interviewer for the Times, if there's one crimp in Mr. Barone's optimism, he writes, it is his caution in assessing the prospects for jury despite its relative security today. He recalled that in Spain, in the 13th century, Jews were diplomats and government leaders. Yes. Yet by 1391, they were experiencing pogroms, and by 1492, they were expelled. They thrived in England in the 11th century, yet by 1290, they too were expelled. Quote, we can't be too sure such that things will last, he said. I don't, my intention here is not to offer a Jeremiah or a crude it can be, happen here kind of rant. But at the same time, when President Obama would often quote Martin Luther King's comment, 
which was paraphrased from the American transcendentalist Theodore Parker, and you know the quote, let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. At best, this comment is inspirational. Perhaps it's aspirational. But to my mind, it's decidedly untrue. History may change over time. But in what direction it changes is not clear at all. Thank you. Um, one quibble, two questions. Please. The quibble is I don't think Menorah Journal was very popular among Jews. It was written for young intellectuals. It was. It was okay, a so journal for Jewish it's not intellectuals. not like he wrote for Newsweek or anything. Or no. even commentary. God forbid. Um, my two questions. One is, is uh, unless Barone addressed this period... Mm -hmm in a non-lacrimose way, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't necessarily contradict his larger thesis about the past thousand years. Mm. And second, I, I've never read, I've read a lot about Barone, never read Barone. 18 volumes, how can those be any good? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try to answer Quibble's questions in some effective way. Barone wrote for the Menorah Journal, which, which was a journal um, that was founded and was written f and supported by young Jewish intellectuals in the late 20s. It wasn't popular in the sense of mass popularity. Barone wrote about the Middle Ages extensively in the second edition, volumes. In volume 10, he spends much time on Iberian Jews. What is so striking about Barone and still inspiring to me today that although we know what his ideals were, that he consistently pursued an anti lachrymose conception, he told the truth about the time the way he saw it. He didn't bury negative events in the footnotes. So, if you want to know how he treated the medieval period, he treated it even-handedly, sometimes so even-handedly that things spiraled out of control. As to how Barone could have managed it, he was an extraordinary intellect. So you think it's good history? <sighs> Barone wrote a number of decades ago, there is much we know now that he wasn't aware of then there's much that can still be learned from him. Obviously, each generation comes up with its own questions. I'm asking in content. I'm say, in content, it's fine. Oh, I'll tell you a story, because a personal story would, might go a long way. There I am, a young graduate student. When young graduate students, maybe there are some in the room, have that wonderful combination of being meek, self-effacing, and self-deprecating, and at the same time, grandiose with a chip on their shoulder. <laughs> right before we were about to criticize our teachers. So Salo, Bar Salo Barone would come marching into the library at the same time almost every day, looking and flipping through the boxes and the card catalog. And finally, uh, hello, Professor Barone, I walk up one day. I don't tie my jacket because I didn't have such a jacket. <laughs> but I walk up to Professor Barone and say, Hello, probably, I said. You wrote in volume 10, page 200 and something or other, X, Y, and Z, and I found it's Q, L, and G. 
And he looks at me with this beneficent smile on his face and said, thank you for your communication. I'll make sure to include your latest research in my next edition. <laughs> Barone knew that he wasn't the last word. He knew that people would continue to, to search and research. But Barone was the ideal which we all emulated. He told us we need to know about the history, not only of the Jews, but of the surrounding culture. And that's why he spent so much time. When I told him I was going off to Spain to work in the archives, he was complimentary and then leaned across the table and said to me, Pray Franco lives. <laughs> Franco was alive then. He thought that when Franco would die, that the Civil War would erupt in Spain again. What, the reason why I'm saying this is, Barone was human. He was not a prophet. He was an extraordinary historian. He trained great Jewish historians who in turn trained me and others in this room. We're aware that Franco died and I was able to continue my research. <laughs> that doesn't diminish anything from Professor Barone. You mentioned a number of times in history um, where Jews lived in relative comfort, mm. the same way they lived up until the time mm. of their expulsion. Mm -hmm. So what were the warning signs that popped up uh. to let people know that this was happening since they lived so comfortably up until that point? Yes. The warning signs. It concerns us, doesn't it? Can we tell? How about if we say that we can't? How about that we say that we can't? How about that we say that later in the distance we might be able to pick up signs we weren't aware of now? How about if that is a way to look at Jewish history and to look at minority history? In fact, you helped me with this question because it brings home precisely why I don't want to follow the anti lacrimose theory anymore. Mm -hmm. There the Jews are in Navarra. In 1494, the Jews have been expelled from Castile and Aragon. There they are in 1497. The Jews have been expelled from Portugal. And there are no signs that they sell their property at any higher rate. Are they blind? No. What do you do as a person, as a human being? You trust in your community and its continuity. And sometimes you're right, but not always. My lessons from history. <laughs> I have a much less important question um, than the one that preceded uh, it. Um, and uh, to, to what extent it concerns the historic historiography that preceded Barone, about which I know absolutely nothing, but uh, to what extent was he responding to a, a historiographical sense of lachrymosity as opposed to, say, um, a theological or a popular conception? Your question is important, and clearly you have wonderful instincts. Yes, he was responding to previous Jewish historians. He was responding to Heinrich Gretz in the 19th century, who may, he may have unfairly labeled as being marred within a lachrymose perception of Jewish history. He was responding also to Simon Dubnov and his communal history of the Jews. So Barone, yes, was within a strong European historiographical tradition that he wished to distance himself from and he wished to carve out for himself. So there was pushback. Last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, in thinking about, in thinking about Barone, uh, he's publishing 18 volumes. He's seeking to create a total conception of Jewish history. He's seeking to create a total thesis. And he really stands between the historians in the late 19th century who are seeking to do that and in the 20th century where historians are not, where historians are seeking to 
do micro history where we're looking to at write her, about 1391 to 1392. Right. <laughs> exactly. Where our goal Not is the entire two years. Please don't get me wrong. I'm a serious historian. Where our goal and, and we, we can't necessarily create an all conceiving conception of, of of Jewish history. And so to use Barone as a jumping off point, lacrimose, anti lacrimose is is to understand its applicability for the specific mm -hmm. historical image yes. that you're seeking to draw. Yes. It's a very fine point. Baron did attempt total history. So did many historians at that time. You're right by comparing generations. And here I say this, Baron failed at his attempt. In the first edition, he wrote about the social and religious history. When he got to the second edition, when he got to the medieval period, from volume three through volume 18 was just the social history of the medieval Jews. He hadn't begun to write the religious history. That's why when he said he was gonna include my later <laughs> research in his second edition, I didn't run home and immediately tell my wife. <laughs> but you're right. The attempt at total history is not something that we do pursue now. We leave that right to your Newsweek authors. We leave that to others. I think what Barone was great about was, and he is a person, that he was a involved, integrated member of the Jewish community insofar as he was concerned about Jewish life and Jewish communities across the world, and that he tried very, very hard, especially after the war, to recreate some of the cultural treasures that were lost. Uh, so Barone was dedicated to the Jewish community. He wrote as a dispassionate historian, but his essays really reflect his passion as a Jew. And he writes, um, in one part, I'll just have to recreate it, that the reason why in the mid-40s he writes this in Jewish Factor and Medieval Civilization, the reason why he had to disdain the lachrymose conception of Jewish history because Jewish pride got in the way that self-pitying Jews did not attract him. And he wanted to leave that behind. And the way he could leave that behind is by saying, look, folks, let's not forget that life was good for many decades. And what I'm saying is, yes, I, who spend my life on 10 years here and 10 months there, just say that that is not needed anymore. We're at a different place within the Jewish community in terms of Jewish pride and Jewish sensibility. And a dose of lachrymosity might be just what the doctor ordered. Okay, thank you. <laughs>